Welcome to Your Career. I'm Debbie Featherston, your host. With me today is Linda Weatherman, the President and CEO of the Economic Development Commission of Florida Space Coast, and Lisa Rice, who is President of Career Source Brevard. I'm delighted the two of you ladies are here today. We are going to in, in, get our audience involved in an interesting conversation that I think they will really want to know about. There's been a lot of changes in the U.S. economy as well as locally, and one of the things that we're really uh, feeling and be beginning to sense, and we're hearing this from different reports, different sources, as they study the economy and the shifts, that it's, we're really going through a transformation. So tell me a little bit from your perspective, I'm going to start with you, Linda, if you don't mind, and just share with me your perspective of what are you seeing in terms of how it's impacting our area specifically. Well, I think in regards to the transformation as it relates to manufacturing, a couple of things were taking place. First, you saw in the 90s and early 2000s, you saw a lot of major companies doing tremendous amount of job mm -hmm. cuts mm -hmm. and doing offshoring, uh, thinking that was a way to cut costs and everything like that. Now you see a phenomenon called reassuring which is taking place the the transformation is not just the reassuring but the automation that's taking place in the, when the reassuring process is taking coming back so you see uh, leaping in technological advances in not only the products that are being made but the process of making the products 3d printing advanced manufacturing you see that all taking place in Brevard County too so in regards to when we talk about Lisa's world when we talk about the population and employees years. This transformation is a wonderful thing. It's going to keep us globally competitive where I think we're lagged behind in the past in manufacturing and awareness of manufacturing, but it's going to require a workforce in manufacturing that traditionally might not have needed to have the expert skills, might have needed a little bit more strength than expertise in certain uh, maybe basic math skills, uh, but that's changing now. So while there is opportunity for us, there certainly is a challenge in an already existing challenge environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And from the workforce perspective, one of the things that we're seeing is, of course, the aging of the workers. Everybody knows about that. But a lot of them are still staying within the workforce. The problem is, is that they haven't gone back and they haven't gotten that next level of skill that's needed, whether it's in manufacturing or just about any industry. And the young folks that are coming in, which we actually have a larger population now that's under 30 than, a, than those who are over 60. Mm -hmm. So this is the group of people that we have to focus on getting them into those manufacturing and the other trades, but they're not interested in it. They're thinking fast, rapid, computers, things like that, and they don't associate it yet with manufacturing. So that's one of the shifts that we're seeing is that we're really starting to educate the younger workforce that what it means to be in manufacturing is not what their fathers thought it meant. No. It's not at all the same kind of world. It's clean, it's computer driven. Even if you look at the wages and I'm I'll be off by maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars but the average wage in Brevard County is 44,000 and change. Mm -hmm. The average wage in manufacturing in Brevard County, both in the same year, is 74,000. Mm -hmm. So not only it, what's happening is, not only is it a clean profession you can go into, but it pays almost twice, what's it, 74, 40, about 70% 70 more mm -hmm. than the average wage. So it's something that's very lucrative. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see those wages drive up more as that supply and demand change, because we do have the challenge of still students or veterans or people going to college and coming back here and looking into whether it's the trades exactly. or the manufacturing right. economy right. that we think exactly. it's so and it's grown here we've done a tremendous great job as a community attracting manufacturing mm -hmm. and I think in many ways the future of, of, of economic development is uh, not just the talent attraction but the building of the workforce and the talent yeah. from within. Yeah. I appreciate that in information and insight because what's interesting here is it seems like we've almost lost a complete generation you know people being involved in manufacturing so to your point Lisa that you are also making you know we the, the idea the what people visualize is what manufacturing is works really different right it absolutely does you know actually another interesting piece that we're seeing though that's happening as well in in many of the um, communities around the nation that are excelling with manufacturing mm -hmm. is one of the things that they're doing is the businesses are investing once again in their training when we hit the recession time, mm -hmm. we hit a time where, guess what? 
training goes out the door. The first to go, right. Very first, and then followed by your outreach or marketing or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But now what we're seeing is that businesses are actually starting to invest once again, invest in their own workers, put into the training piece because they know they've got to get them caught up to this new marketplace that's coming back on shore, the new technology that's coming in. So that's a plus side mm -hmm. for that younger population. It's a plus side for the workers who are already in the workforce there right. too. Because I think a lot of the people that are, you know, have left this, the, the Space Center and others, there's, this is a really, I think, um, a sounding, to me, it's, it's, it's a voice of hope. Yeah. It's like, wow, this is encouraging because, you know, I can retool, I can get additional education, I can really take the skill set that I have, that technical skill set, and reapply it with some training, some education. I just need to become, as I say, retooled. Exactly. Right, exactly. And also in manufacturing, you probably won't in one industry sector find such a... Um, I call it a food chain <laughs> skill mix where you can yeah. come in and have be a novice and still have a job and work and if your skill and that ability is takes you certain certain level you'll certainly have a job if you have more uh, keen skills and a more uh, expert with numbers and precision tuning and uh, you can work your way up but either way of your capabilities in manufacturing you're offered something there as opposed to some places that either you use low pay low skill high pay and high skill Mm -hmm. uh, you you have that difference uh, and that uh, and that stackable ability to move up if you have the ability and the need and the drive to do that. A lot of industries don't offer that. You either right. you know make beds or you're the manager of a you know hotel or something like that, and it's kind of hard to find that difference. And that's a, a, the other thing that I think is a is a best kept secret about manufacturing and plus the pay which which you actually just triggered another thought for me which is around um, females going into the mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. industry you know we haven't seen that traditionally happening again in those communities where manufacturing is thriving you're seeing more of a push to educate females that this is a very viable option for them it's not about that might and that strength to be able to move and muscle around the things mm -hmm. it's more and about your your ability to work with people and work with the technology that's before you. So yeah, that's an excellent great alternative. That's an excellent point because it also it also shows where there is an archaic version of what manufacturing is. Because when you say, well, why don't women well because women think, well, Rosie the Riveter. Exactly. Well, and that's what we're, that's what you want and like you said you need the muscle to do it. And it's changed so much that there's not a there's yeah. not just a a generation we have to uh, inform it's a gender side exactly. too that we need to inform too exactly. because there's a good uh, opportunities and again the pay and the demand will be there right right because when I think about manufacturing today I'm thinking more robotics yes. you know I'm thinking people have to really be able to use more of the science the mathematics in some cases to be able to operate machinery but even yeah. the hands-on things yeah. like the welding and everything right. welding takes a very fine touch mm. and honestly a lot of times women have a very steady fine touch that can make this happen easier mm -hmm. so there's mm -hmm. some there's even been some studies I don't know if you've ever seen some of this stuff studies around um, welding and who actually mm. does better at it and they're finding that women can actually do better at it steady hands focused right. Right. you know they they stay right with it they want it to be perfect not saying That's, a guy doesn't want to do yeah. that either yeah. but it just kind of yeah. lends itself more to the welding and welding is one of the big things that's missing right right now in manufacturing. Finding right. welders is not easy. Good mm -hmm. welders is and not welders an easy And welders that can read thing. blueprints. So not only oh, is yeah. it just a, a <laughs> finite hand-eye movement, it's not just the welder who's going to put something together that might be, right. I don't know, I'm not going to be dismissive of the old welding, but it's now we need a more sophisticated understanding exactly. of welding. And so it's not just finding somebody mm -hmm. who's just not afraid of mm -hmm. this burning thing that holds. Exactly. So, yeah. so what are some of the initial steps? We've got about three or four minutes before we go to break. But what are some of the initial steps that that, you know, we collectively are doing here locally. CPT. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, it's two ways. Number one, it's it's identifying a pathway for a student. The same way someone who goes into healthcare and understands, I become an LP, I an RN, and then I work my way up mm -hmm. the novice to expert in the health nursing care industry. You see that pathway naturally. How did that develop? I don't know. People <laughs> talked about it and stuff like that. We need to make that in our nomenclature of manufacturing pathway from novice to expert as easy as people understand. You get 
an AA, a BA, and a PhD exactly. work down the road. That makes sense. The manufacturers need to understand the the pathway themselves. That the days of just hiring a few people and hoping that they work, that if they have a more, uh, if you will, academic process, understanding certifications, how they play a role, uh, will help them get the right people as quick as possible. And the third thing is, and we'll kind of this is what we talked about before, is the image and attraction of manufacturing. Yes. yes. To talk about the, that that this is a good profession, it's a growing profession, it's a noble profession, and you will make a wonderful, wonderful career, and you can go to college if you want, but when you come back, and if you have a degree that's not applicable, if it's not, you know, I would love to have an history degree, mm -hmm. uh, neither to have to pay my bills, so... Mm -hmm. Get your history degree, come back here and get a CPT. Mm -hmm. best of both worlds. I, I keep saying, you know, I'll do it again here. We need some kind of like a reality TV show similar to a Duck Dynasty <laughs> that's built around manufacturing. Because I'm telling you, it's what draws the I thought the you said we were going to have a Laverne and Shirley show. Yeah, right. Here. No, not quite that. <laughs> No, it's like yeah. It yeah. But it is it is about, you know, showing real life. Right. This is what right. this looks like. And and that if you start at this, you know, basic level, you can have a ladder and a career and you're right. We don't know what that career is completely. The employers don't know what that career ladder looks like yet either. So it is a development of that yeah. piece, which is happening right now. Yeah. Well, that makes good sense. I mean, if you, whenever you think about, you know, uh, job families and you think about career ladders or just career progression, mm -hmm. right, within a within an industry, employers are concerned about retaining their people. They want them to start out here and be able to continue to build that skill. You know, get to different levels where of mastery, if you will, right. So, makes good sense indeed. So, um, you know, here in Brevard, we have a unique, I think, relationship with the public schools as well, where they're, I think about the STEM jobs, you know, the STEM mm -hmm. uh, fields. And that really all the jobs we're talking about are really related to or building on these STEM fields or using people that are coming out of those areas, the science, the technology, the engineering, and math, right? right. For anybody that doesn't understand what STEM means, in case it's new to them. So, you know, when we come back from a break, I really want to talk about that. Any thoughts about that, though, be before we go to break? Well, yeah, okay. first and foremost is that most of our younger people are, are concerned, if they're not excellent at math or science or something, that this isn't going to be a field for them. And that's not absolutely the truth. This is about applied science, math, technology. Mm -hmm. When you take it and you apply it, it's a whole different world than learning your algebra and your calculus right. and stuff like that. Right. It's just a different world and a different feel. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I know in the public schools, our, you know, our students come coming out of the schools who are choosing to go through the career and technical education programs, yes. wow, what an advantage they're, they're going to have. Absolutely. And the other thing, too, is that STEM is not necessarily a four-year, six-year degree in right. mechanical engineering. That's and right. I, I could uh, quote a few. There's an article called The Hidden STEM Economy mm -hmm. by the Brookings Institute. And you see that. You can see over 50% of STEM-driven jobs are less than two years college degree. They're certification right. jobs. Mm -hmm. So l let's not deny students that might not want to go to a four-year and get an engineering degree right. or a six-year and master's mm -hmm. degree uh, the ability that they're as capable of getting a STEM economy job as anyone else. Well, we'll have to make that our last point. We're going to go to break. We'll be right back. You've been watching your career, and again, we'll be right back. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Welcome back. You're watching Your Career. I'm Debbie Featherston, your host. And with me today is Linda Weatherman, President and CEO of uh, the Economic Development Commission of Florida Space Coast, and Lisa Rice, President of Career Source Brevard. So delighted. Lady, let's pick up, ladies, let's pick up our conversation. Uh, really, Linda, I'd like to start with you. We were talking, uh, we kind of talked about the challenges beforehand, right? So I'd like to just get a sense from your perspective. You had mentioned the CBT. Tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit more about what that is. And well, basically what it is is I've got 
met with my peers that were involved in the workforce, the Brevard Public School System, Eastern Florida State College, uh, the Career Source, and the EDC. We got together, and one of the things we wanted to do was uh, to promote with the, with the EDC taking sort of the organization lead on that, just because mm -hmm. we do work with all of those organizations, um, where we've identified uh, a, a certification, which is an entry level certification. The Career Source has helped us identify that, called the Certified Production Technician. Okay. This is just for your first step that if you come in and you get the class uh, and you get your certification, that's telling the manufacturer that I have fundamental core competencies to walk into a manufacturing floor. The reason the CPT exists, to talk about our transformation in manufacturing, is the National Association of Manufacturers only maybe it was eight or nine years ago or less, got together and said, you know what, maybe we should have a ubiquitous, agreeable certification amongst ours. So even within the manufacturing world, we had not even developed a agreeable, ubiquitous certification. It was done, what, you know, how do I know you have certain certification in you in Iowa and you in Ohio? So the manufacturers kind of got together and developed mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. We just make sure all our manufacturers know about it. So we have our first class, starts June 2nd. We have it filled. Thank you to the uh, career source uh, in identifying students and uh, students uh, for the class and some mm -hmm. funding sources. Uh, we also have uh, Eastern Florida State College as we'll be doing the training. And this is the first step in, if you think about a triangle right. of the stackable certifications, we want these students to go through that. We'll have more classes after that. We'll advance the classes. Half these students already have jobs. We'll talk about on-the-job work, which is important. Uh, but yet, to show you the importance of these, these are manufacturers that had employees that are working on the manufacturing field already on the floor saying, you know what? I want my, my some of my employees to have the CPT. Mm -hmm. So to me, that brought credibility to the respect right. that they're already on the floor and still they want them to go get the certification. Mm -hmm. But we do understand that that's just a one step. That's just a a certification step 1.1 that we hope over the course of the next year and future years that we have a very sophisticated, well-known path that our community understands manufacturing so much that if students come out of high school or go to the army and come back that they understand part of their DNA that yeah I know there's a future and this is the path I can take because I think that's what's prohibited students going into it in, in the past because I think students go and they work in retail nothing wrong with retail but they go into retail because they see retail I became a teacher because I knew I saw teachers. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there was other careers out there. Um, so that's what we want to do. We want to make that as a, as a uh, articulate the manufacturing world and pathway as easy as they do in the regular mm -hmm. lay world of retail and mm -hmm. grocery stores and things that they see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that makes a lot more sense given what we were talking about earlier, that we know manufacturing is far more sophisticated than it was in the 50s and 60s and even the early 70s. Yes, mm -hmm. You know, and of course at that point that's when we began, you know, to begin to see more offshoring of it so it's nice to hear that it's coming back to our shores because there's a lot of talent and capable people that really will want and need those jobs. Yeah and it's also uh, we have to understand too that manufacturing is it's I feel and maybe I'm, the words are too strong but I really feel it's a national security issue. Oh, yes. You have to it's a fundamental fact of any economic base that you have to have a, a product that you export to import the dollars in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you get the multiplier and that is on software you can do it on uh, if you want to export oil and see the reverse happened with us mm -hmm. we imported the products and exported right. our dollars so we've got to reclaim our manufacturing world because it's a serious national security issue because it's the fundamentals of our economy and it's it, and it's a the fact that we have a renaissance taking place, we should be joyous in this country that's taking place. But there's so much work that has to be done. And Absolutely. people like Lisa has got a, a lot of work and right. with mm -hmm. on-the-job yes. training, which is a real fantastic Absolutely. thing to do. Absolutely. You know, I was th reading that we are in our country is investing $4.3 billion in um, the training, right, in 255 training programs. Right. That are, I know they're going to come a lot, you know a lot more about this. Tell us a little bit more about this and, and, and what the role of the uh, Career Source Brevard really is going to have here. And, you know, that's been going on for years and years and years, that there's been multiple tracks of how do workforce training types of dollars come down. Um, what I will tell you is that there's just recently been an agreement between the House and the Senate at the U.S. level um, to agree on reauthorized reauthorizing the Workforce Investment Act. That's a big deal because part of what it does is it takes something like 15 of those different programs and it says goodbye to them and it collapses them down into um, this Workforce Investment Act, a new act. 
they're calling it actually the Skills Act. It does some other things, changes with board membership and things like that. We're still sorting through it. But it's going to get to a more streamlined version of how do those federal funds flow that can help with training this workforce. Mm -hmm. um, Linda mentioned one thing, which is on-the-job training. The the ability for us to subsidize someone's wage while they're going into a workplace and getting through a training plan that the employer has said they got to do this before they're a hundred percent ready to go is a huge huge factor in helping some of these mm -hmm. entry-level folks get in and Honestly, it's not just entry, it's any level of folks getting into the um, workplace. One of the things that we've seen is that they have better sticking power when they go through an OJT. Uh, what I mean by that is usually the OJT takes four months, maybe up to six months worth of time. By four to six months, you're in. Yeah. You, you've learned the culture, you know, kind of your ropes and stuff. You may be still learning some technical pieces, but you've learned a lot about the business culture and you're fitting. Mm -hmm. And what they're showing is OJT is one way for us to make sure that we're getting p the right people in and having them stick to the workforce. I see that as a transfer of learning as well, right? It absolutely is. And it goes back to, again, that older workforce that is starting to phase out, becoming a mentor and becoming mm -hmm. a, a person who does a lot of this training um, right on site mm -hmm. with the newer folks who are coming into the industry. Newer could mean any age, by the right. way, just exactly. newer into the industry. So we're very excited about that. The board has actually um, done a little bit of a shift this year, actually a big shift this year, in that 70% of our training funds will be geared towards OJTs. That's huge, you guys. Mm -hmm. That's a little over $700,000 that will be going just towards OJTs this year. So we're looking for businesses who are interested in that. We need to talk to them. We need to get them on board before they ever hire anybody. Um, but it's a great way for a business to benefit, for the job seeker to benefit. Obviously, it's a great one for the manufacturing industry to benefit from as well. Absolutely. Very exciting thing. That is exciting. What are some of the other kinds of programs that, you, that you're going to have you know, here or will be available to the workforce. Right. And we always have individual training that right. somebody can come in and they can work towards um, getting a degree or a certificate. Again, though, our board has shifted that focus. So there's only going to be about 30% of the funds available, about 300,000, a little over 300,000 available for individuals. That's a huge change. Mm -hmm. So it is going to mean that we're going to look very carefully at what are we sending people off to school for. Um, high demand occupations. That's what the board has looked at. Manufacturing happens to be in that. Um, so it's a win-win right there. Um, healthcare happens to be in that as well. Anything in aviation, absolutely within that. That's what we absolutely see growing. Anything out to, with the port, the logistics, the distribution stuff that they have to have, all the project management pieces that are going to come. The port is going to be one of our largest employers here within just a very rapid amount of time. Um, we're talking two to three years and they'll have thousands of jobs that are happening there. So we're gearing up today for what does that look like, how do we train people, um, everything in the marine kind of industry and that relates to the ports will be involved with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Uh, what else, what other insights, what are some of the other things that we need to be doing as a workforce, if, whether we're an employer or we're the employee, what are some things that, you know, maybe we need to be thinking about or, or you know, be prepared? How can we prepare ourselves better? An employer or an employee? Either way. Whichever, depending on what. what Boy, I know what I I'd say. Number oh, well, one, this is what I always say. It's go back to school, learn something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I say it all the time. It's yeah. lifelong learning. Just because you're in a job and you're good to go and you think you're fine and dandy, no, you're not. You never know what's going to happen next. Go back and learn another skill. Go back and brush up on an old one. Learn yeah. something. Constantly learn something. Yeah. And from the employer perspective, you know, I think the biggest thing that I would say to businesses is look back again at this point and see what you can start to put into your training because you're going to have to worry about your succession plan. Right. And a lot of industries, a lot of yeah. businesses 
haven't thought about that. Yeah, at that's all. a good point, Lisa. Because if you look at the manufacturers, you know they're not all Umbriers, they're not all Northrop right. Grumman's and Harris. The sure. majority, quite frankly, play, probably employ 45 and less. Mm -hmm. And that's usually we have a single owner mm -hmm. who might be in the 60s right now. And think I think there's a tremendous opportunity for young people to take a leadership position where you have someone that might mm -hmm. be retired and they might not have thought about a succession plan and if they don't guess what that company shuts down that company mm -hmm. shuts down we lose those jobs exactly. so just by a almost a natural lack of planning we wind up losing jobs that we fight so hard to keep and to retain so right. that's a very good point yeah. uh, I think those are excellent points because one of the things that I do when I'm coaching uh, clients is always think about keep your eye on the trends so once you've got right. that job keep an eye on, on the trends and begin to analyze what are the trends and what are the implications on your career for additional training, education. Right, and the beauty with the, and, and the, the reason it's easier to do now without spending a dime than it was 10, 15 years ago, is you have the internet. You can constantly calibrate Gosh, your career. Yeah. You can calibrate what you're doing. I'm constantly, I'm, no, I'm sure Lisa does the same thing. I'm constantly checking and spying on my competitors, find out what they're doing, <laughs> if there's something. We're always a step ahead of them, and I like to say, but why not? You always, and normal, or otherwise it'd be like you, you, you couldn't do it. So you have an easy, free access to calibrate your career, where right. you are to date, where your competition's doing, and maybe where your skill matches with your industry and the future of that particular skill. Okay. So even have the ability to go out and take online courses for free that'll you yeah. know, it's yeah. not going to necessarily get you into a job but once you're in that job it could help you brush up on some skills you know just improve in one area at the very least right. so Absolutely. it's it's right there at your fingertips it's definitely something that people need to be taking advantage yeah. of and I, and each one of us has hired people i'm sure you've hired people too and that's something i look for too you know you always look for you know that constantly improvement it's what can i do you know what i've always said about the EDC and when I've made my uh, talk to my board of directors I'm governed by a board of directors like Lisa's and you know I've always told them that the EDC is better this year than it was last year and I've said it for 20 years and the EDC will be better next year than it is this year and that's how you have to do it because it's a war I mean it constantly it's, it's an economic war an economic development and it's a war to continue and get good workforce at mm -hmm. least that's a struggle with so every day you're fighting that so we're yep. asking ourselves that the way so I would think that employees when I go through the hiring process, if I'm hiring somebody, I'm looking for somebody who wants to, to improve. You want to get that, uh, exactly. uh, it's like that uh, article that came more. out, uh, What Makes Johnny Run. Remember the yeah. story, What Made oh, Johnny Run? Because yeah. he wanted to run the, the organization in a few years. So he ran to deliver his mail instead of when his competitors, when his peers walked. So what makes Johnny run? So the question is, what gave him that? And every student should read that old uh, the Harvard Business Review article from the 60s. And what makes Jane run? But Jane better run. Uh, because <laughs> somebody in another part of the world wants that job. So. Uh, that's absolutely right. And that's going to have to be the last word. It is always, it is a pleasure to be with you, ladies. Thank you for Thanks. taking the time and coming and sharing this important message to our viewers. Appreciate that. Well, you've been watching your career. I'm Debbie Featherston, your host. And on behalf of my guests, and the crew here at the set of your career. Thank you for watching and remember, be career happy.